During the late 1950s and early 1960s, a cultural shift took place. Art went from looking like this to looking like this. Art and culture began to obey a completely different set of rules and logic systems. And this is because culture had shifted from modernism to a new thing called postmodernism. And postmodernism is a big complicated word that not very many people understand. But in 1989, the cultural theorist Frederick Jameson wrote a book called Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. But in order to understand postmodernism, we have to understand the thing that came before it, which is something called modernism. So here's a quick overview of modernism. Modernism was the cultural logic of the Western world from the late 1800s up until about 1950. And it was characterized by a break from tradition, a constant search for a new visual language and a gradual shift away from realism towards abstraction. Modernism was really big on styles and movements. It was always coming up with new movements. It was everything from Impressionism to Post-Impressionism to Expressionism to Cubism, Surrealism, Constructivism. The list goes on. It's basically all the isms. This transition from Modernism to Postmodernism was more than just a new movement or a new style. It was a new cultural logic. So all the movements from the late 1800s to the 1950s were modernist movements. And all the movements after 1960 were postmodernist movements. I made this diagram so you can see what I'm trying to say here. Like modernism and postmodernism are umbrella terms that many different styles of art come under. And the final movement of the modernist logic was something called abstract expressionism, which began to fade away at the end of the 1950s. And after abstract expressionism, we begin to transition into the postmodern age and pop art is the first movement to dominate the postmodern age. Jameson claims that our cultural logics are intrinsically tied to our political and economic system, which for most people watching this video will be capitalism. And Jameson says that capitalism has had three main stages and each stage of capitalism has given birth to a new cultural logic. The first stage of capitalism was something called imperial capitalism. And imperial capitalism's cultural logic was realism. Capitalism's second stage was something called industrial market capitalism. And its cultural logic was modernism. And our current economic system is something called late capitalism, also sometimes called post-industrial capitalism or neoliberalism. And our cultural logic is postmodernism. So what are the characteristics of postmodernism? Well, the first feature that Jameson identifies of postmodern culture is a kind of depthlessness, a flatness, a new kind of superficiality. And he demonstrates this point by comparing two paintings of shoes, one by the modernist artist, Vincent van Gogh, and the other by the postmodernist artist, Andy Warhol. Van Gogh's shoes were probably worn by its owner for many years. They conjure up visions of agricultural toil and rural poverty. But despite all of that history, there's a kind of humble pride to these shoes. They represent a hard, honest day's work. You can see every brushstroke in this painting. It contains Van Gogh's unique style. And there's a kind of utopian gesture to this image. By painting these shoes, Van Gogh is transforming them into something vibrant, proud, and almost a little bit heroic. This is a modernist painting through and through, and it contains depth, both visually and conceptually. Now let's compare Van Gogh's shoes to Andy Warhol's screen print, The Diamond Dust Shoes. First thing to notice about The Diamond Dust Shoes is Visually, this is a very flat image, as in there is no depth, it's entirely surface. But it's also depthless in the sense that it doesn't really contain any profound meaning. Unlike Van Gogh's shoes, these shoes aren't functional and they don't tell a story. They're just a bunch of luxury products in a line. They may not have even been worn. Jameson describes this painting as a random collection of dead objects hanging together like dead turnips. 
Now, I'm not arguing that the Diamond Dust Shoes is a bad artwork. It's definitely an accurate representation of the world that Andy Warhol was living in. But it is a very surface level image and it is kind of superficial. The second feature of postmodern culture is a waning of affect or a loss of emotion. In the postmodern era, art seems to lose its sense of expression or feeling. Artistic self-expression was a really big part of modernism, and there seemed to be an endless supply of tortured artists expressing their deep innermost feelings through the medium of paint. The Scream by Edvard Munch would be a prime example of this, but since Roland Barthes declared the death of the author, and the death of the artist in 1967. There was no longer an individual to do the expressing. Therefore, postmodern art is way less interested in the identity of individual artists and their feelings. In postmodernism, the individual is deconstructed and fragmented, and in the process, they're turned into a surface or a symbol. It's not like postmodernism doesn't have any feelings or any emotions. It just doesn't have feelings and emotions that are centered around the ego of the individual artist. Jameson describes feeling in postmodern art as more like free floating intensities. And these free floating intensities can be negative, but they can also be euphoric or fun. Before we go on, please don't forget to like this video and please don't forget to subscribe. And if you feel like you get value from my content, if you've been watching my videos for a while now and they're really helpful, please consider supporting me on Patreon if that's something you can afford to do. I would be deeply, deeply appreciative and it would allow me to keep making videos like this one. The third feature of postmodern culture is something called pastiche, which is basically a fancy way of saying copying, parodying, or remixing. Modern art really valued things like authenticity, originality, or the genius of the individual artist. And modern art was always trying to generate new movements, new styles, new aesthetics. So it didn't really need to reuse old styles. Postmodern culture, on the other hand, doesn't seem to generate new movements or aesthetics in the same way. So as Jameson puts it, the producers of culture have nowhere to turn but the past, the imitation of dead styles. Pastiche can be seen quite clearly in fashion, where we're kind of constantly in nostalgia mode, like the 2000s or the 90s are always back in style. Postmodern architecture also uses a lot of pastiche. It's notorious for cannibalizing all previous styles of architecture and presenting them in a very mishmash, pushed together way. I made a whole video on this and it's called Learning from Las Vegas Architecture. If you're interested in postmodernist architecture, I definitely recommend watching that video after this one. And in the world of visual arts, there was a movement in the 80s called the Neo-Expressionists who attempted to revive German Expressionist painting, which felt quite inappropriate and out of place because Original German Expressionism was a reaction to the horrors of the First World War and a protest against the corruption of Weimar Germany, whereas Neo-Expressionism was more like a trending style, but they were taking all the aesthetic tricks from German Expressionism, but using them in a very commodified and superficial way. But Jameson argues that this aesthetic colonization of the past is not a coincidence. In the postmodern age, we've somehow lost our awareness of history. And as a result, we're now increasingly incapable of producing styles or aesthetics that represent our current experience of reality. And so we consume old styles and old aesthetics, which don't have any meaningful relevance to the present moment beyond being trendy. But I don't think pastiche is always bad. For example, a lot of Kanye West's early music was just a sampled soul track with a hip hop beat on top of it. And that music was incredible. So it is also possible to use pastiche to create something new and vibrant and relevant again. Jameson claims that out of all the arts, it's architecture that has been able to flourish the most in the postmodern age.
And this is because architecture has the closest financial relationship to multinational capitalism. And it's not short of funding, nor is it short of new projects. And Jameson identifies the Western Bonaventure Hotel as a prime example of a postmodernist building. There are three entrances to the hotel, but there's no grand entrance. They're more like back doors. Just like the Pompidou Center in Paris, it's a kind of total space, a complete world, a mini city within itself. And just like postmodern painting has a very surface level quality about it, so does the Bonaventure Hotel, which has a glass reflective skin. So when you look at the building, you're actually seeing the Los Angeles skyline reflected back at you in a distorted way. Jameson argues that this creates an aggressive vibe, like when someone's staring at you with sunglasses on so you can't look back into their eyes. Once you enter the hotel, the first thing you notice is the elevators, which are constantly rising and falling, like these big kinetic sculptures. Travel primarily takes place on a vertical axis in this building, and as you shoot up the elevators, you see the Los Angeles skyline shrinking beneath your feet. And at the base of the escalators is the lobby, which contains a greenhouse roof and an artificial lake, and according to Jameson, is somehow both empty and constantly busy at the same time. Joining off the lobby are four symmetrical towers, making it quite impossible to get your bearings in this lobby. It's a very sophisticated building, but it's not ideal from a human perspective. Getting around is very difficult. It relies on elevators and the building is so symmetrical that it's really easy to get lost or go in the wrong direction. Jameson argues that this building represents the predicament that we as individuals find ourselves in. We live in late capitalism, completely overwhelmed by information networks. Our inability to comprehend or to understand the Bonaventure Hotel is symbolic of our inability to comprehend or navigate the world of late capitalism. Jameson calls this feeling of being unable to process the sheer quantity of information available within late capitalism, the postmodern sublime. And the Bonaventure Hotel represents the postmodern sublime in the sense that humans just can't get their head around it. It's too sophisticated for the human mind and the human body. So let's finish off this video by talking about why it's important to understand postmodernism. So Jameson writes about postmodernism from a very historic perspective. He's not being moralistic. He's not trying to celebrate postmodernity, nor is he condemning it. He's just saying we should accept it because we live within it. Let's try and understand it. And that's kind of what this book is. It's an attempt to map out the postmodern cultural terrain. And he does this because within the world of postmodernism, it's becoming increasingly difficult to create art that's political, subversive, or in any way radical. Jameson was very aware of this predicament, which is why he states one of his intentions for the book was to project some conception of a new systematic cultural norm and its reproduction in order to reflect more adequately on the most effective forms of any radical cultural politics today. So, like I said before, this book is kind of like a map and it describes the terrain and the features of this strange cultural landscape that we all exist and are making art within. So if we want to make art that's meaningful or radical or in some way politically defiant, it's really important that we understand the postmodern culture that our work exists within. So if you are an artist or if you're a creative, I would definitely recommend giving this book a go. It's not exactly a light read. It took me ages and there was a lot of things even I struggle to understand. But I would definitely say it's worth giving it a go. Like, for context, I read this book when I was in my early 20s and just didn't understand it. I came back to it now in my late 20s and I would say I understood a bit more of it. But it's really dense. There's a lot in here. So it's a book you have to come back to multiple times if you really want to get the most out of it. Please like and subscribe and see you next time.